Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in saying the call to worship. When the world divides us, when the world calls us orphaned, when the world leads us astray, Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill this place. And now please join in singing hymn 129 found in the maroon books in your pews. Friends, the Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. Let us then open ourselves to this Spirit and confess our sins with faith and humility. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, kindle within us the fire of your love to burn away our apathy and indifference. Send your winds of change and transformation to blow away our fear and rigidity to the old ways. Breathe your spirit upon us, that we may not be conformed to this world or to our ways, but to your ways and to your kingdom. And hear us now as we lift up in silence our own prayers and confessions. Sisters and brothers, like the rush of a violent wind, the Holy Spirit filled the house, changing each language and making them one. With this same Holy Spirit, God will make us one 
In the name of Jesus the Christ, praise God, you are forgiven. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please share a sign of peace with one another. Good morning. I'd like to welcome any children to come forward or children at heart. They were all over the place. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Here we go. Hello, Philip. One of the other big kids. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a muttery crowd today. <laughs> okay. So can anybody tell me what today is? What is today? Sunday. Sunday. Wesley wins the gold star. <laughs> anybody else surprised? Uh, so in addition to it being Sunday, what type of Sunday is it? It's data breakers. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> I thought all of the wise guys stayed in the back of the room. <laughs> today is a day, i got to give you a hint now, today is a day that begins with P, the letter P. Today is the Sunday of, of I'm going to have to cheat here, Allison? Pentecost. Today is Pentecost, and so today is the day we celebrate the birthday of the church. Isn't that a wonderful thing? What are some of the things that you do on birthdays? What are some of the ways that you celebrate birthdays? Anybody got an idea? What are you doing on birthday? It sounds like it's a very exciting day. Do we have? Okay, here. Thank you, Wesley. You invite people over. You invite people over. And what do they eat while they're over there? What do you, they, what do you eat at a birthday party? Um, usually cake and some other snacks. Yes, cake and some other snacks and... and um, maybe even ice cream. And so, in the early church, they had a problem, and the problem was that there were all of these people that wanted to know about Jesus, but they spoke so many different languages, it was hard for them to understand each other. And they didn't have Rosetta Stone or any of those other learning programs, and so, Something happened on Pentecost. Oh, that, I'm not sure that feels good or if it tickles. Oh, wait a second. Sprachen Sie Deutsch? Yeah. Say habla espanol? Y hablo espanol. 
Something amazing happened when those tongues of fire came down. Allison, could you explain this, please? Sure. These look like ribbons that you wrap a birthday present with. But today, we're going to pretend that they are the Holy Spirit, and they are called tongues of fire. Can you look around and see any colors that might look like flames? Red? Look at the choir. They are very spirited. We've got orange, yellow, and all the other colors of flames, even purple, blue. So these are tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit is a form of God, and we can see God or feel God through the wind or the fire and the elements of the earth. And so today in Sunday Studio, we're going to talk about weaving our communities together and doing actually some weaving as we um, bring our languages together and how we're all very different. And one reminder is if you are a third grader today, it's bridge day. So third graders are sitting back with Jennifer G. So if you are a third grader, join her. And we would love you to stay here for a special song, and I'm sure all of you know it. And we will do that. All right. We have some budding performers here in the congregation. Uh, welcome to all of you. And um, this is generally a good check. You can see kind of who lives on the north uh, side of the city. And I see some people who did venture across Beta Breakers, and a special gold star for you. If you are one of those who, who made the trek uh, across, make sure you get to the front of the line and get a cookie or something delicious first after the service. Uh, it is an honor to have you uh, here with us. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here along with Joanne and Victor. And uh, you have already heard and will continue to hear our wonderful choir. A um, few things to lift up for you. First, if it is your first time uh, visiting, uh, please uh, let us know that you are here. There are fellowship pads uh, in the pews, and you can provide your email address or uh, preferred means of communication, and we will gladly follow up. And if you have any questions or prayer requests or anything at all, uh, there are welcome cards in the pews. Just complete one of those, and uh, you can place it in the plate at the time of, uh, of offering. If your prayer requests are confidential, we are honored to receive those as well, and do take each and every one of them seriously. Uh, there are many ministries going on for people of all ages. Uh, you can read about several of those in your bulletin and others on our website. Uh, a few to lift up for you. First, at uh, 5 o'clock tonight, we'll have our live at 5 service featuring uh, Vernon Bush uh, of Glide, our own Dave Scott. And this evening, we have a special guest, uh, Reverend Dr. Douglas Fitch uh, of Glide, will be bringing the message. So uh, even if you're already here, go out, enjoy the afternoon and uh, come back at five and enjoy that experience. Uh, we also strive to be a congregation that does more than talk about uh, doing good things and living our faith out in the community. Uh, a couple of opportunities coming up in the next week, one at Boys and Girls Clubs and another to serve at the food pantry. Again, more information in uh, the bulletin. We uh, want to uh, make sure to lift up, and there is a, a big old insert in the bulletin, that next Sunday is uh, the concert uh, that these fine folks have been preparing for for a good long time. Look at how sharp y'all look today. Wow, we're ready. It looks like Pentecost in here. Yeah. So at 3 o'clock uh, next week, you'll have an opportunity to come and hear the concert. And uh, we do ask that people uh, purchase tickets in advance. It helps with planning. There is a discount for that. But please note that if that presents a financial hardship for you, we, we welcome you. We are happy to confidentially receive any requests and make sure that you come and get to hear the music. Um, part of the reason that we are, are charging for tickets this year, there's an opportunity to help fund a, a very important ministry, and uh, Chris Nichols, president of the choir, is here to tell you about it. So Alden Gilchrist came to Calvary in 1951. Uh, beginning as an organist and soon became the director of music, a position he held uh, between the two of them for more than half a century. Calvary celebrated Alden's 25th, 50th, and 60th anniversary as our director of music. In the last celebration, the world-famous conductor Kent Nagano, who admired Alden, was flown in from Montreal to rehearse and lead the choir and orchestra in a performance of excerpts from a cantata that Alden wrote. Approximately 1,000 people came and filled every nook and cranny of this place to help celebrate Alden. 
Beyond Alden's expansive musical abilities, it was his profound qualities of humanity and kindness and spirit that won us all over, each of us one at a time, until, until he simply became a beloved human synonym for the best of Calvary and Christian expression of faith through music. So what do you do in the Presbyterian Church when you want to come together, and honor somebody that you love, you form a committee. <laughs> so we uh, formed a committee um, and there were many of us, this was an unusual committee, it was uh, members but also friends of Calvary. It was, but what we all had in common was each of us had uh, a unique and in some case very, cases very long lasting relationship with Alden. So uh, the members of that committee, just to say their names so you know, is Paul Angelo, uh, Carolyn Alexander, um, Joe Beyer, uh, Carol Fox, Ross Wilson, and Lydia Titcom. So we worked on it for a while, and we came up with three different ways to honor this wonderful man. First, we named a conference room that was his office with his name, and it's right up there and we're in the process of getting that fixed up. There will be framed pictures, a brochure to tell people who did not know him of his contributions to Calvary. Second, we will be publishing some of his music, and we'll get started with that after the concert that you just heard about. Third, we will establish a music scholarship in his name. This program will be offered in partnership with the San Francisco School of the Arts, we will provide funds each year to support private lessons for several deserving students who could not otherwise afford them. Applicants will audition and winners will also be featured in a concert at the school as well as perform in at least one church service here at Calvary. And through that, we will build a new relationship with that school that will hopefully be a portion of the realization of Alden's passion for supporting music in schools. We offer to any people that wish to contribute to the fund supporting these ways of honoring Alden to do so at this concert and afterwards. There will be people at the ticket tables who will be able to help at intermission and after the concert to take any donations that you may want to bring. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, again, many thanks to the choir for your perseverance through many challenging times and your hard work now in joyous times. Uh, I trust that, that, that Alden smiles upon the incredible ways that Michael and John and all of you are carrying forth his legacy, and Chris, thank you so much for lifting up and providing the opportunity for us to honor him. So please uh, do be here and, and enjoy uh, the concert next week. A um, couple of things. First of all, those who normally sit in the balcony, thank you uh, for, for coming down all together. There uh, are different studies on ways that congregations uh, sit together, and with uh, us being at about half of normal attendance on Beta Breakers, uh, we thought it might be nice for people to be together. And with today being Pentecost, um, one of the, the things about the original Pentecost, people were, it was a little chaotic. People were a little close. They may have even been within arm's length of another person, believe it or not, um, during that time. And the Spirit moved through them, and amazing things happened that day. And uh, we are so thankful that you are here and hope that you have a profound experience of the Spirit on this day. I invite you to join with me in taking a deep breath. Exhale your worries, your concerns, and lift them up to God as we continue in worship. Today's Bible passage is the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. It's found in Acts 2, 1 through 21. Uh, I think it's page 885 in your pew Bible. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all those who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Jude and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphyla, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we heard them speaking about God's deed of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine in the morning. The word of the Lord. Yes. Little beta breaker scripture for you. <laughs> Please continue with me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we ask that as you always do, that you breathe your spirit out upon us. Uh, but we acknowledge that that may be scary. Help us be ready to listen, ready to hear something new ready to move as your spirit blows. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, on, on a Sunday in worship in a particular church, uh, there was a new visitor who had, who had come in. And uh, in listening to uh, the moving music that, that the choir was bringing that particular day, uh, the person stood up and, and said, Amen. And no one else was doing that. People didn't want to stare and be rude to this new guest, so they just sat uh, quietly and listened as they always did. But as the, the service went on, there was a prayer uttered in the service, and a little while later, this, this same woman said, Alleluia! And again, people kind of looked over and, and wondered, is, is something wrong? Did this person sneeze? What, what has happened here? And things really escalated a little bit later in the service when the woman stood and dropped a J-bomb. She stu stood and said, Alleluia, praise Jesus. She had the audacity to say the name of Jesus. And at this point, an usher rushed to her pew and came over and said, I I'm sorry, ma'am, are you okay? Is, is something the matter? To which she responded, I, I can't help it. I've got the Holy Spirit. And the usher looked down at her and sternly said, ma'am, this is a Presbyterian church. You did not find that here. So, some of you have heard, and if you're new and visiting, uh, that uh, we have the nickname the Frozen Chosen, these Presbyterians. And uh, it, there are really uh, a staggering number of, of jokes and stories about Frozen Chosen uh, floating about throughout society, including one about an interdenominational inter gathering that was in a church, and all of a sudden uh, a fire had broken out, and a Pentecostal yelled appropriately, fire! There is not a fire, just for the record, if we have any fire marshals here. The, the Baptist then yelled, water, and the Presbyterian then stood and yelled, order. <laughs> and if you've been around enough Presbyterian churches or meetings, you know this is probably something that could have happened. Again, the frozen chosen. There can be good things about order. And if you are uh, newer to this place, uh, please know that uh, there's not a ranking of denominations. I didn't grow up uh, Presbyterian or any other particular denomination and do not rank us as in higher regard or closer to heaven than others. 
But if you are newer, we want you to know that, that Presbyterian is derived from the Greek term presbyteros, which means elder. And that has to do with the way that we, we govern ourselves and make decisions. And there is shared power between the members and leaders of the church, the, the laity, or those of you sitting there, along with the pastors in the decisions that we make. Uh, whether they be financial, about other things in the church, there's an equal vote between pastors and elders. And this came about, sorry, is my mic acting weird? Yeah, it is for me. Okay, is that a little better? Okay. So this came about in response to ways that priests and religious leaders uh, prior to the Protestant Reformation, were abusing power in some cases. There were sales of indulgences or people pardoning sins in exchange for money. And there were other issues as well, but that was one of them. And so people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox and many other forefathers and foremothers in the church devised a system and believed things, for instance, that uh, people should be able to read the Bible for themselves. Um, they have a direct access to God through the priesthood of all believers, that they need not come through some pastor or priest uh, to be saved, that people could have a direct link to God themselves. And if you are a person who is Catholic or of another denomination, uh, please hear me. We are on the same team. Presbyterians, uh, even very recently, make mistakes all the time, and incredible people like Pope Francis are out there trying to change the world, and we are grateful for the t ways that we team together uh, with other denominations, with Catholics, with other faiths. We are a congregation that welcomes people of all beliefs. But this, this business of order, this business of being the frozen chosen, while it can be helpful in getting things done and making decisions that are of the people, there are some times when we can be so frozen that we, we fail to take any action at all. And so on this date, we remember Pentecost. We remember the birth date of the church. And Pentecost uh, essentially just means 50. It was 50 days after the very first Easter, 50 days uh, after the Passover. And on that very first Pentecost that we, we heard about, amazing things were happening. People were able to hear God communicating to them regardless of their language. It was as though all of the, the political parties and conventions and languages all had come together under one roof, and God was able to speak a message to them that they could understand. That alone was miraculous. But it was so miraculous that as you heard in Jim's reading, uh, people didn't know what to make of it. They accused these new Christians of being drunk. And Peter, who had clearly not been to a beta breakers, uh, just used the excuse that it was nine in the morning. So, of course, they could not have been drunk. But Peter in Acts preaches his first sermon, and Peter had this, this strong feeling and was so moved that sisters and brothers would see visions, that they would dream dreams, that miraculous things could happen. And from that first Pentecost on, miracles did happen in God's name. Now, I invite you uh, to open up your pew Bibles, or you can Google we're going to turn back to Acts, this time on page 886. And I would invite you to read uh, together 886, over starting at verse 43, under the heading, Life Among the Believers. And we'll read down through 47 together. All right, let us read together. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Whether you are uh, new to faith or, or exploring or have been around a while, uh, if you were just to read two books of the Bible, Luke and Acts would be very good ones to read. You would, would get a good overview of how the early Christian church came to be 
and, uh, and an understanding of the amazing things that, uh, that Jesus did and continues to do. So I encourage you to do that on your own because, again, we do believe that the Holy Spirit speaks directly to people, not just through those with microphones. Now, hearing these stories, uh, the, the miracles that we can read about in Luke and Acts and other places in the Bible, uh, they bring so much hope, and they uh, make us wonder what, what can happen. What can happen when God speaks to others? But being uh, a naturally pretty skeptical person, um, as, as I was and can continue to be, uh, it's natural to write these things off. And, and part of the reason that uh, I ended up in a Presbyterian church was uh, the church's desire to balance head and heart, head and heart. When someone says that they believe that, that God is guiding them to do something or calling them to do something or that God spoke to them, uh, people often rightly ask good clarifying questions about how that came to be. We all know that, that too often in society, too many leaders have said that God told them to do something and at best case did something self-serving, if not downright evil. So if anyone in this church ever says that God absolutely told them to do something, it doesn't mean that isn't the case, but we would probably want to come together as a community and ask some questions about how exactly uh, that came to be and, and what that means. We wouldn't just accept it blindly. But if we believe what we read here, if we believe that God is still speaking, are we ready to listen? Is God still speaking or are we too frozen to actually listen? Are we so stuck in our heads that we cannot listen to the heart? And how do we figure this out? How do we balance between the head and the heart? Dr. Tom Long, who is a professor at Candler School of Theology at Emory University and was at Princeton Seminary before that, uh, among his many books, and one uh, lifts up the phrase, uh, salvitur ambulando, salvitur ambulando, which means it is solved by walking. It is solved by walking. This balance between head and heart, trying to understand what God may be calling us to do, he believes can be solved by walking. Walking in community, sometimes literally walking as we pray that God may still be guiding us. Now, I wonder today how many of you have some, some sense, or maybe at some point in your life, have had some sense that God may be guiding you in a different direction? Maybe to a different job, different school, different relationship, uh, maybe sometimes even a different city. You know, that, that can be scary. Maybe you had a dream in which something appeared to you, and being the very rational folks that we, that we are, we want to write those things off as just, you know, our subconscious messing with us, and it couldn't possibly be God speaking to us. Does God still speak? A professor uh, wrote about an experience of this. It, it happens to be a professor at a Christian university. And this professor says that though he is a professor at a Christian university, that he would consider himself to be chief among those who are skeptical about uh, divine experiences, about supernatural experiences. He said he could read about these things in the Bible and read about other experiences, and he is at, at best skeptical about them. He is openly critical of religion that is too experiential, too emotional wants to keep it more in the head, as you may expect as a, from a professor. He said he was that way for many decades and had written many books, and then he had an experience that opened his mind more than he would have expected. See, this, this professor and his wife went to visit a former pastor of theirs. Uh, this former pastor had lived a good long life and was in his last days with a terminal illness, and the professor and his wife went to see the pastor. And upon doing so, they met the twin grandsons of their pastor, these 14-year-old boys. And again, let's, let's call him uh, Professor Daniel or Professor Skeptic, had this sense upon meeting these boys, said he heard this inner voice say, you will have a profound impact on one of their lives. You will have a profound impact on one of their lives. Now, this professor just said he just wrote this off as a brain hiccup, just something that didn't make any sense and moved on. Some time passed, uh, about three years, and the, the family of their pastor who had, who had now died uh, came to visit the university. And 
one of those twins came to this professor and said that he had a sense of call. He had this, this feeling that God wanted him to be involved in music ministry, that this feeling had emerged over time, and this particular college happened to have a very good music ministry program. Now, the trouble is, this particular young man and his family uh, did not have enough resources for him to attend the school. They were of, of limited means, and uh, there just weren't enough scholarships and other forms of financial aid available for him to attend. But the professor, thinking back to this time when he had this, this feeling, this sense that God wanted him to do something, listened and took it seriously, and he said he prayed. He went out for a walk. It is solved by walking. He went out for a walk and prayed to God, if there's some way you can use me to help this young man attend college, please make it clear. Help me understand. About a week passes, and this professor, after lifting up his prayer, is again out on another walk, out thinking, not really thinking about the particular young man's struggle, but just out walking. He said all of a sudden he had this, this feeling. Something came to him, this same inner voice that had spoken to him about the young man, gave him a book title. Now, he had written other books and admittedly had not made much money from them, um, but he said something was very different about this. He received not only a clear vision of a title, he received a vision of, of chapter headings, of, of detailed outlines, and he sat down over a two-week period and said that 200 pages of a manuscript just poured out. It, it was almost effortless, and it felt as though it wasn't coming from him. And he said that he knew it wasn't from him for two reasons. One, he said it was much too clever, not something he could have thought of on his own. And two, it would sell. And these were things that his books didn't really do in the past. And you know, normally in the publishing world, uh, this, this professor had some relationships, and he knew an editor and a publisher, and like many others, they had several layers of filters. You, you typically can't just call one of them and say, I have this great book idea, because everyone is doing that. Now, this professor sent his book idea to one of them, and immediately the publisher responded and said, yes, that will sell. And then something happened. Uh, he received an advance that was 10 times what he had ever received for any book he had written in the past. Now, let's remember, he, he prayed about how he would help this young man, but weeks had passed, time moved on, now he has this offer on the table for an advance. But something else is going on. The professor and his wife have a house, they have a modest house, with a very leaky roof, very leaky roof, and the amount of the advance is exactly the same as the cost to replace the roof. All right, how, how does he interpret this? He said he and his wife uh, figured they had no choice but to replace the roof, and, and they made plans. Meanwhile, uh, weeks have, have passed, and the young man is probably not going to be able to go to this college. The professor is out on another walk. It is solved by walking. Out on another walk, when he hears the same voice that spoke to him when he first met the boys, that gave him all of this book information that just poured out, and now this voice had another thing to say. And he said it really made him angry. This voice said, it's not your money. It's not your money. And he said at this point, he's openly arguing, saying, what do you mean it's not my money? I wrote the book. And the voice says, it's his. And it named this young man and explained how it was for him to be able to go to college. And at this point, the professor responds, saying, but what about my roof? What about my roof that is leaking? And he said he just had a sense that it would work out. And he went home and spoke with his wife, who was also very nervous about the roof, and they agreed that they would, would give the proceeds to help this young man go to college. And between uh, scholarships that he did end up receiving and this money, he was able to attend. Now, uh, the, the professor uh, says that in seemingly providential ways later, he actually did receive funds to replace his roof. But it wasn't something that made any sense to him. He wanted to write off all of these feelings as brain hiccups. And he said part of the reason why he believed so firmly that it was some way that God's spirit, spirit was communicating with him is because he had been so skeptical of these experiences, and he did not want to give away his money. 
You know, this, this wasn't uh, his subconscious telling him that he should go buy a new Ferrari. This was giving money in a way that he didn't really want to in his own selfish way. But he did. He had some sense of guidance. Now, I don't lift this up, and do not worry, this is not going to become a prosperity gospel church uh, where we start selling prayer towels. I, I'm sure, you know, they would be hot sellers if we wipe off our, our sweat and sell it to you, as some televangelists do. But to wonder whether maybe, just maybe, God does still speak, and sometimes through our many layers of defenses, we are too frozen and defensive to actually listen. You know, in this congregation, I know there are many of us who don't get our way. This does not mean that, that we get to pray for whatever we want and we always get our way. Looking around this congregation now and thinking of others who would love to be sitting here with us today but cannot because of health concerns, there are many people whose prayers do not feel like they're being answered in the way they want them to be. I know there are some here today who are wrestling with whether you will be able to stay in the city with the cost of living and your job market. Um, others are wrestling with, with chronic pain, with a medical prognosis that does not look the way you want it to. It doesn't feel like you're getting the answers you want. Could God still be speaking? Could God still be speaking by someone sitting near you, by part of this community embracing you and helping all of us listen together for the ways that, that God may be presenting solutions for us, or if nothing else, may just be present with us during those challenging times. Could God still be speaking? There was once a man who was in an area where torrential downpour continued for many days until it reached the point of flooding. And this particular man climbed up on his roof climbed up on his roof, and as he did, the, the waters rose to a point where a man in a rowboat came by, and the man in the rowboat said, come, the waters are rising, it's flooding, let, jump in the boat, let me help you out. And the man said, no, God has my back, God will cover me, God will protect me on your way. The waters continue to rise, continue uh, to rise until it is obvious there is going to be a problem. At this point, a jet boat comes by, with a seat ready for this man, saying, come, save yourself, jump in the boat. The man again says, no, God will save me. Jet boat moves along. Finally, the water's up to the, the very top. It is coming down to the last moment. A helicopter comes by with a ladder lowered and says, man, climb, save yourself, let me help you. And the man again says, God will save me, on your way. Now, finally, the waters rise to the point where the man drowns. He loses his life. And upon reaching heaven, he makes his way straight over to God and says, where in the world were you? I was praying, I was praying for you to save me, and you let me drown. And God responds to him, I sent you a rowboat, a jet boat, and a helicopter. I did my part. Sometimes God is speaking in obvious ways, and other times, much less so. But the Spirit is always moving. The Spirit is always speaking. Sometimes we need others around us to help us listen. And my prayer for each and every one of you, each and every one of us, is that God would melt the layers of ice and the defenses and the things that can make us so cynical that we will not hear the voice of the divine. Amen. <laughs> In contemplative prayer, we listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. I'd like to call you into a moment of silence, and then I will conclude that time of prayer with a poem by my friend Marin Tirabasi, wherein she uses the word Pentecost as a verb. That's your warning. And then we will conclude with the prayer Jesus taught us, which is printed in your bulletin. So please, with a deep breath, join me in an attitude of prayer, listening for the Spirit.
Pentecost us out from the safe upper room into a crowd of strangers. From a church birthday cake faith with slices for us to a red balloon gospel that will escape our tight fists and float into the world. From the received wisdom of those in the responsible years between 32 and 60 to the excited ideas of teenagers who may be wrong and the fractured wisdom of elders with memories leaking everything but love. God, whose name is love, we lift to you our world, the places torn by violence and famine, disease, and the scourge of poverty. We lift to you our country, divided bitterly and looking for authoritarianism and different ways to continue the war. We lift to you the church, especially our sisters and brothers in the United Methodist Church who this week are gathered to determine their future. And we pray for our city. May everyone this day be safe. May everyone this day glimpse what it means to have a full and abundant life. And may we model Christ to each person we meet. And now with the confidence of little children, we are bold to repeat the prayer you modeled for us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. Amen. As we continue worship, you're invited to fill out the fellowship pad if you have not done so already, updating what information you can get, share with us. Pass it down the pew and then back so you'll know who you're worshiping with. The ushers will now come forward. And I would also like to draw your attention to the um, uh, stewardship bar chart in the, um, in the bulletin a little visual reminder that we are 90% to our pledge goals, which is an A minus. It's okay if you're happy with an A minus. You can stay there. Just saying. Let us continue to worship God.
We thank you, God, for the gift of this day, for waking us up this morning and giving us a song to sing. As we enter your world, remind us that each person we meet bears the face of Jesus Christ. This we ask in your many holy names. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen, praise Jesus. All right? People of God, allow the Spirit to unthaw each and every one of us. Do something bold today. Introduce yourself to someone after church you have not met before or whom you met so long ago you cannot remember their name. And something practical I invite you to consider this week, write a question mark in your phone on a piece of paper somewhere and let it represent your openness to God speaking to you in an unexpected way. And if you want to talk about things you're wrestling with, Joanne, Victor, myself would be honored to walk along with you. May we all go forth remembering that we have a God who is still creating, that the Holy Spirit is still speaking and singing and dancing and breathing, and Jesus the Christ is still walking, and we are His hands and His feet. And God's gathered people said... And God's gathered people said? Amen. All right, Pentecost.